This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All hit radio. To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the X Zone. I am Rob McConnell, and we're still coming to you after 26 years from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to check us out online, Exxon Radio TV on all social media sites. And our website for the radio TV show is exxonradiotv.com. And for our network, where you can find out all about the Exxon, the other shows that we have, 724-365 or 24-7-365 or whatever combination of those three little instances you'd like to put together, www.xzbn.com. We're also on Radio X across Europe and around the world on Talkstar Radio. To thine own self be true, Romeo and Juliet, and a plethora of other classicals that we had to learn in high school, The Merchant of Venice being another one. And I could go on and on and on, but already you're saying, what's going on in the Exxon? He's doing Shakespeare now. Well... For a very special reason. My guest this hour is a young lady who is um has got a very interesting book out. It's called Shakespeare Suppressed. Catherine, how do you pronounce your last name? Children. Catherine Children. Catherine Children is our guest. And um Catherine is basically looking at hidden history exonation. It's pretty obvious from the title of her book and the little Examples I gave you of my oh, massive knowledge of Shakespeare. Yeah, I failed it in school, gang. Um, who was this major literary figure? Do we really know? Hmm. The mainstream historians want us to believe the biography they have presented to us. However, the profile of this great author doesn't match the biography of the man from Stratford. Not Stratford, Ontario, either. Uh, Stratford, Ontario. What was the name of that, that young guy, that singer? Oh, it'll come to me anyway. This is going to be a very interesting hour, Exxon Nation. So joining me now is Catherine Children. Did I say it right, Catherine? Chiljan. 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 Yeah. All right. Chil- Ch- Chiljan. Chiljan, right. Chile in January. All right. So Chile in January. So here's Catherine Smith. No, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much for joining us all the way from San Francisco, beautiful My city. My pleasure. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself first. Well, I am an independent scholar um, who's been involved in the history of the real Shakespeare for over 30 years. Uh, I was a history major at UCLA a long time ago, and I just shortly after I graduated, I got into this, and it's just um, electrified me ever since. <laughs> Wow. And by the way, my producer, Craig, on the other side of the glass, whispered in my ear, Justin Bieber is from Stratford, Ontario. And, of course, William Shakespeare Shakespeare was from Stratford in England, right? Stratford-upon-Avon, yes. 
that that is the traditional story. But unfortunately, if you really look at the evidence, it really is an unproven theory that the Stratford man was the great author. And that's what my book's all about, is to show you the evidence and how so much of pretty much the entire evidence that a professor would tell you Mm -hmm. that points to the Stratford man, it's all after he had died. That's the evidence that they use. But if you look at lifetime Mm -hmm. evidence, which is normal, um, you don't see any evidence at all that he was a writer. We have evidence that he was involved in the theater, that he owned shares, and that he was uh, a member of an acting company. But that is about the extent of it. So am, am I getting this this inclination, right, that history lied to us again? Um, yes, it did. <laughs> I think it was purposeful, but I think mm. it was done after both of these two different gentlemen, the, the man from Stratford yes. and the real author of the plays, after they had both died. Uh, yeah, just and like... I think ultimately it was political, but, um, you know, mm. that's... I I agree with you, and this is why we've got to go to a break, but I'm just going to close off with this, that they're still teaching children in schools in Canada and the United States that Christopher Columbus discovered America. And we all know that is anything but the truth. We'll be back on the other side of this break. www.shakespearesuppressed.com is Catherine's website. And we're talking about the truth, the hidden story, the hidden history of William Shakespeare, don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone radio show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? I'm Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, and on The Secret to Everything, we will merge the practical with open investigation into all realms of the mysterious. We will talk to cutting-edge alternative health practitioners, those who inspire and motivate you in business and life, 
And of course, we will share stories of the paranormal, conspiracy, and cryptozoology. You will transform because of the frequency I carry, the frequencies my guests carry. Life may never be the same after you listen to this program, for the secret to everything is for you, the listener, for those who desire more in every area of their lives and believe that it can still be found. Listen and discover the secret to everything.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. All right, XO Nation. My guest this hour is Catherine Chilgen. And uh, we're talking about the suppressed truth about, you've got it, William Shakespeare. Her website is Suppressed Shakespeare. I'm sorry, ShakespeareSuppressed.com. That's ShakespeareSuppressed.com. All right, what do we know about not the guy that they want us to know, but the real Shakespeare, the Shakespeare that you investigated and that you're bringing to light. How different is one from the other? Well, uh, the first one would be the breadth of his knowledge. He had an incredible amount of knowledge. Um, He knew several languages, modern languages, classical languages. He knew... um, Medicine, there's over 600 medical references. He knew astronomy, he knew botany, hmm. uh, he knew the law, plant, you know, so many things. And that is indicative of somebody who was greatly educated, right? He yes. had to have gone to university. Like, yeah. for example, uh, the subject of rhetoric is only uh, taught at university level during those that period. We're talking mm-hmm. 16th century. It was not at the local grammar school. So he, he had to have been some, someone who had such access. And yet, when you look at the education of the Stratford man, all they say is that he had a grammar school education, that he probably le- you know, left school when he was about 13 to, to go into the trade of his father. Um, that's a, a big disconnect from the very beginning. Is it possible that he was self-taught? It's possible. However, you know, they didn't have public libraries back then. So um, if you were somebody who showed great knowledge and promise and genius, um, there were such things as, um, you know, like a a form of scholarships, or you could have a patron that would, would sponsor you. But as far as we know, there is no known person who's come forward, you know, that we found in, in history that he was associated with, um, other than the Earl of Southampton. But um, he was uh, the, the one person that Shakespeare made a dedication to. But there's no evidence that the two knew each other. So uh, yeah. it's problematic, to say the least. Another reason mm-hmm. that would um, indicate a disconnect is that um, there was a lot of politics in the Shakespeare plays. Like, for example, um, in Hamlet, um, the character Lord uh, P- P- Polonius, uh, he was a counselor to the king. And um, it's accepted by many historians that that was a lampooning of 
the high counselor at the time in Queen Elizabeth's court, Lord Burley. Now, how can you get away with lampooning uh, such a powerful person and not be prosecuted? And there's no evidence that Shakespeare was ever prosecuted. And yet you have other writers like Samuel Daniel and Thomas Nash and Ben Johnson who were all prosecuted for some, you know, writing their, some of their plays. So um, that's another disconnect right there. Well, is it possible that the person who we call William Shakespeare was actually a pen name that was used by a number of different people, each having an expertise in this specific craft? Well, you are correct that it William Shakespeare was a pen name. Ah. Um, I don't quite, I, I do see a common voice in all of the, the Shakespeare plays, mm-hmm. so I don't quite, um, you know, go for that theory. Um, um, if you l- look at the name, how the name was hyphenated, almost half of the time that you saw it in print during the 16th and 17th century, it had a hyphen between shake and spear. It's a descriptive name. Spear shaking. And that was a common expression back then because of, you know, they used swords back then, That's right, not yeah. just guns. And um, so that's, a hyphen is not enough to say, okay, that's a pen name. You have to look at what we know about the great author, which is, uh, amounts to very little. I mean, we, we don't have any manuscripts written in the hand of William Shakespeare or letters. We don't have any payments to Shakespeare. Um, we don't have um, any notice of his death. You know, things like that. No one claimed to have known him while he was alive. So when you look at all these zeros, and then you can say, okay, and the name had a hyphen, then it makes sense that this really is a pen name. You see, even in today's uh, media, for example, uh, there there are groups of people who will write TV series, and they'll use a pen name of one person, but it's actually the work of many people behind the scenes. And I'm just wondering if this is what happened in this case. Um, Like I said, it is possible, Mm -hmm. but I don't think so. So Um, give me me your uh, hypothesis. Well, um, you see, uh, some, uh, some Shakespeare professors today will tell you that he partnered with some other writers mm-hmm. of the period. And the reason they do that is because Shakespeare wrote so many plays in a relatively short amount of time. So to give him a little slack, they, uh, in my opinion, they are, uh, they're trying to make him partners with other people. Um, I, that was not the case. The, the real case is that the great author was writing decades earlier than the Shakespeare professor will tell you today. He was writing um, in the 15. 15- 60s and 70s and 80s, and you ask the professor, and he'll say Shakespeare started writing in the 1590s. So it, it's partially to kind of explain uh, how, how prolific he was in a short amount of time. Um, but no, I, I, don't, I don't think it. I think the Earl of Oxford was the real author, and I think that he wrote all these plays by himself. So what do we know about the Earl of Oxford that we can that we can take what is known about the Earl and connect it to the William Shakespeare that we all believed was a real person. Well, the first thing is he was an aristocrat. He was the 17th Earl of Oxford. And that during this period, if you were someone of high rank like that, and you had an interest in literature and the theater and the drama and writing, um, that was something that you didn't want to be well known. So it was common for those of high rank to use pen names. And he was uh, a champion of the joust. So it would make sense that he would call himself a William, well, I don't know about the William part, but uh, a spear shaker, because he was a spear shaker. Um, the, the jousting instrument was called a long spear. So he was also the Earl of Oxford known to have written anonymous, anonymously. So that's another indication. In fact, someone um, during the period said that he was best in comedy. And, and also some contemporary writers um, mentioned, you know, by inference, mm-hmm. that Shakespeare was someone of high rank, that he also wrote anonymously or, or with an alias. 
So um, those are just a few points. The Earl of Oxford was known as a, 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 a patron of the arts and music. And um, he, he p- patronized many books to be published, uh, history books, music books, um, poetry works, things like that. So he was definitely in the literati. He was definitely, you know, known mm-hmm. um, so, so- as a writer. And yet... Even though he was known as best in comedy, nothing in his own name has survived. So that's, mm. the, you know, kind of a disconnect, and that puts us back to he was using a pen name. And what was the pen name? William Shakespeare. A- am I correct in, in believing that, uh, if my memory serves me correct, uh, that he wrote approximately 35 to 40 plays and then in somewhere between 155 to 160 sonnets and uh, two long narratives, right? Yes, yes. He was I- incredibly prolific and all of very high quality, you know. Um, mm. You know, this man had about a 17,000 word vocabulary. The next writer of the period, you know, dramatist of the period, uh, would, would be Christopher Marlowe for the breadth of his uh, 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 vocabulary. He had 7,000. So he was really. I mean, he was an extraordinary individual, and yet no one claimed to have known him during his lifetime. Hmm. You know, uh, so there's yeah. always silence around him. That's the problem. Okay, well, our researchers came up with this on uh, on Shakespeare. At the age of 18, Shakespeare married 26-year-old Anne Hathaway. The Conservatory Court of the Diocese of Worcester issued a marriage license on November 27th, uh, 1582, the next day, two of Hathaway's neighbors posted bonds guaranteeing that no lawful claims impeded the marriage. The ceremony ha- may have been arranged in some haste since the Worcester Chancellor allowed the marriage bans to be read once instead of the usual three times. And six months after the marriage, Anne gave birth to a daughter, Susanna, baptized the 26th of May, 1583. Twin sons, Hamnet and daughter Judith, followed almost two years later and were baptized on the 2nd of February, 1585. Hammett died of an unknown cause at the age of 11 and was buried 11 August, 1596. It seems that there's plenty of, of, of references to, uh, to Shakespeare. There are, but none of them are of relevance to writing <laughs> or education. That's the problem. So, so what are we and saying here? That's something that's not normally noted is that um, his, the Stratford man's parents were illiterate, mm-hmm. and so were his children. So this, um, again, is a disconnect between what you would expect of someone of such high knowledge and prolific, being prolific in literature. All right, so why would history lie to us? Well, that, that's the ultimate question, you know, the disconnect. Uh, but um, what makes us believe that the Trapper Man was the great Shakespeare was from a book that was published in 1623. And today we call it Shakespeare's First Folio, but it is actually um, a collection of 36 Shakespeare plays. And there are about 15 or 16 opening pages mm-hmm. um, where there are tributes to Shakespeare. And there's also that famous... Uh, face engraving, supposedly, of Shakespeare. And in one poem to Shakespeare, there's a reference to Stratford Monument. Mm -hmm. And then on another poem by another uh, poet is a reference to Avon. So you have Avon in one section and Stratford on another. But Stratford upon Avon nowhere is in, in that in those opening pages. So that is basically all we've got to point to Stratford upon Avon and, and but there just so happened to be somebody named William Shakespeare from Stratford upon Avon. Isn't that a coincidence? Um, if you uh, the other evidence that a professor will tell you is that oh well, there's a monument to him in the Stratford upon Avon church. Well, if you look at early uh, reproductions, uh, you know, during this period in the 1600s, of what the monument looked like, it's totally different from what the monument 
we have today. The first monument uh, was a man with an, an effigy of a man holding a sack. And in today's monument, it's a man whose arm is resting on a pillow holding a pen. <laughs> so something happened there, too. But what about his friends uh, that, that, that were well-known and who um, collaborate the existence of William Shakespeare, the playwright, the author, the poet, uh, John Hemmings, and Henry Condell? You know, they were yes. two fellow actors of Shakespeare's. They published a more definitive text known as the First Folio. And, right. And, and they have a lot of, you know, why would they lie about this man that didn't exist? That's a great question. Um, the, it can be partially answered um, in that, uh, see, Hemmings and Condell, they were actors of the mm-hmm. period, and they signed two letters in the first folio, the book I was describing to you. Um, one was to the patrons of the book, and one was the letter to the reader. And they signed their names, Heming and Condell. Unfortunately, it's been known for over 200 years and accepted by scholars that it was actually Ben Johnson, a writer of the period dramatist, who wrote their letters. So that's a kind of a first uh, indication that we've got a hoax here. Well, what, what about his children? What about the marriage certificate? Has anybody done any research in to see if that there's any, any doubt to, the, to the, the wedding certificate, to the birth certificates of the children? No, I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't doubt those things at all. I mean, the, they, see, the, the thing is, there are two, dif- two different men with two different lives. You know, but, how, one, but how do we know that? It's a great... One artist whose life was hidden, mm-hmm. and the other one is uh, the Stratford man. You know, it's, it's a, conspiracy theories are always fascinating. But what we find in every conspiracy theory is it's just a theory. Because... There are no direct ties in this theory to, to say beyond a shadow of a doubt, unless I'm missing something here, that the William Shakespeare that we know about and that history teaches us about is not the person who he was. Well, uh, it's really an unproven theory, as I mentioned, because... The only evidence that we have of writing mm-hmm. or education happened, you know, anything tying that to the Stratford man happened after he died. It's not during his lifetime. We don't have any evidence of his education. Um, they had just assumed that he went to the grammar school in Stratford-on-Avon, but they don't have proof. Those records don't survive, unfortunately. So really it is an unproven theory that the Stratford man was a great author. Uh, his father. What do we know about his father? That we his could use as... His father was um, John Shaxper. Mm-hmm. Actually, the name was pronounced... If you look in the, the documents of the period, the name mm-hmm. was pronounced Shaxper um, with a short A. It okay. was rarely spelled like the great author Shakespeare. Okay. Um, he was a wool trader. And... Um, he was a wool... He was a wool a, trader? They, a, wool, a trader in wool. He wasn't and an alderman? Also perhaps in making gloves. He wasn't an alderman? And yeah, he was an alderman, yeah, at one point, yeah. Okay. Um, but um, as I mentioned, the, the monument to Shakespeare in the, in the church is mm-hmm. a man holding a sack. And it could very well have been, you know, a sack of cotton, you know, or not cotton, but the wool. Could have been a sack filled with cats, a sack filled with garments, a sack filled with manuscripts, a sack filled with poems. Right? Okay. Well, it doesn't look like paper. <laughs> All right, listen, you and I have to take a break. We'll be right back. Exxon Nation, we're talking about Shakespeare conspiracy theory. Fact, fiction, man, or just another fable. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away.
Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. Welcome back, everyone. Catherine Chiljan is our special guest, and we're talking about William Shakespeare, To Thine Own Self Be True. And we're trying to decide whether or not William Shakespeare was the great person that many people believe he is, or is he someone else? If you'd like more information on Catherine, her website is www.shakespearesuppressed.com. What about the uh, the people who believe that um, he actually went to 
What's the name of that school again, Craig? Uh, da, 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 da. King's New School in Stratford. Right. Um, it's po it's very possible that he did go to the school, but mm -hmm. um, there are no records uh, of of that of that time that survived to prove it. Well, but that, that the, going to the grammar school mm -hmm. isn't enough for somebody of Shakespeare's unbelievable breadth of, of knowledge and education. But what happens so if he, what happens if he was a savant, well versed in everything? What happens if he had been reincarnated? Like so many people believe that people who are reincarnated come back with a wealth of information. Well, there's a lot of learning, and you, you, you I mean, you can be a genius, mm -hmm. like with numbers and things like that. But to, you know, know French and Italian, I mean, that implies some sort of being taught. Um, he also knew was very familiar with European geography, specific mm -hmm. places, and yet there's no evidence that the Stratford men ever left the you know England to go into the continent um, and he had knowledge of the aristocracy and things things that just um, a non rank, highly ranked person would know um, and I mean he knew the law on top of it in fact that is what got Mark Twain who he was using a pen name sure. Samuel Clemens that that got him interested in this controversy and he wrote a book about it called is shakespeare dead he did wrote that in 1609 uh, sorry um 1909 um you know you have to they had law schools back then mm -hmm. and we also have the records of people who attended law school and there are no william shakespeare's there we also have the records of the universities and there's no william shakespeare there well, so. how, how do we know that there are no records? Who's actually gone through each and every school, each and every, uh, each and every law school, each and every university to see if William Shakespeare was these, actually these are, there? It, the, the, the records are out there, um, and the scholars have, have looked. And, um, you know, they, they, scholars have been combing all sorts of records to find anything, anything of, of relevance about the great Shakespeare's life, and they just are coming up with nothing. I mean, there is no, no plain manuscript in the handwriting of Shakespeare. I mean, as you mentioned, over almost 40 plays mm -hmm. and all these sonnets. How come there's not one letter of, you know, signed William Shakespeare to somebody? Maybe that's um, what know, was in the bag. He had to have written a letter. <laughs> we have letters that have survived by other people who were not famous. Mm -hmm. Many, many, many in England have survived and diaries and things like that. We don't have anything like that. But I will bet you office. I will bet you there are a lot of people who are well known in history that if we take a magnifying glass to their life, we would find a lot of consist inconsistencies as well and a lot of missing documentation. So in the big realm of things, if William Shakespeare wasn't William Shakespeare Besides the fact that it's a, it's another fallacy within the educational system. How does that? What difference does it make in the life of a human being today? Well, um, t to know who the real author was will help us understand the, the works better. I mean, there's already a little bit of a barrier because they're so. You know, we've got the language, uh, they spoke slightly differently back then. But there are so many um, life reflections in the works. Mm -hmm. um, right now, they can't connect with the Stratford man's known life. Um, anything in the works that is a, like a little bit of a, you know, um, autobiography or anything. Um, and if you look at Shakespeare's sonnets, um, they are 154, 14-line poems, and most of them are written in the first person, and they are extremely personal. And they tell you a lot about, he tells us about himself. And he does tell us in a way that he is highly ranked. Like um, he says uh, in Sonnet 62, Methinks no face so gracious is as mine. And gracious was a term that you apply to someone who was like a duke or somebody who was mm -hmm. even higher, a prince or a king, that term. And he is saying that his face is gracious. Um, 
He's also said, were it aught to me, I bore the canopy with my extern, the outward honoring. That's on at 125. The only person who would have the privilege of bearing a canopy over the monarch, and that's what it meant to bear the canopy, would be somebody who was highly ranked or very distinguished. So, you know, these are little subtle clues if you look in the sonnets, which were in the perverse person, um, indicating he was somebody who was highly ranked. You know, it's, it's no secret that, you know, since about 230 years after Shakespeare's death, people began to actually wonder about the authorship that was attributed to him. You know, and, and I know that others were proposed as alternative candidates that included Francis Bacon, Christopher Marlowe, just to name a couple, as well as the 17th Earl of Oxford. However, there's only a very small minority of academics that believe there is reason to question the traditional attribution and to question the existence of the William Shakespeare that is known. So I, I don't understand the, the importance if there's only a very small minority that are still questioning if it was William Shakespeare or not. Yeah, they, they don't question it, in my opinion, perhaps because they're either not aware that there's so little evidence uh, connecting this track for them to, to, to writing or education. Either mm -hmm. they're, they don't know about that, or they just uh, prefer the status quo. They don't want to upset, you know, because... If it was proven that it really was a pen name for someone else, mm -hmm. um, you know, their their papers and their books and, uh, you know, reputation, it's not going to be that great. All right, so, so if William Shakespeare wasn't this person's real name, let's say William Shakespeare was a pen name. Um, there, are other, there are other authors out there, even to today, that use pen names. And you, just like you said, Mark Twain was a pen name. And my question is, what difference does this make? Well, um, we're going to understand the works so much better if we have the real author. We, we have a real biography. Uh, if you accept the Earl of Oxford, he's got a fantastic biography mm -hmm. um, that fits the, the profile of the great author to a T. And... Um, you know, he, he, he went to Cambridge when he was eight years old. He, he really was, you know, <laughs> a child prodigy. Sure. Um, his father, uh, he grew up with a troop of actors. His father had actors. Okay, if, he if was it, if it is. involved in the theater. I mean, we have all that. All right, so if you're saying that we don't know very much about the real William Shakespeare, and this is what we're saying, right? Right? We don't, we don't, yes. Um, okay. If you the, if you're looking at the Stratford man, we have very little. Okay, so we have very we to have the theater or writing. Or we have very little to go on. Does that mean it's not real? Does that really mean that he did not exist? Does that really mean just a minute, just a sec here? Does that really mean that? This person is not who we believe it is because we cannot find the information? Yes. We're talking 300 years ago. But we do have many, many records of that period that have survived, and there should have been something. A and I'm sure there are many, many yeah. records that did not survive. That's true, too. So what proof? I'm, but, I'm not talking, as I I'm not, just a sec, I'm not so talking, the problem is, oh, wait a is second, hold on here, hold on here, I'm, oh, not, sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm not asking about theories, I'm not asking about possibilities, I'm saying what proof, what physical evidence is there that the William Shakespeare of Stratford is not the William Shakespeare of Stratford that we think we know? There, there were two people named William Shakespeare during this period. There was a Stratford man who was involved in the theater. Okay. And there was a man using a pen name, William Shakespeare. They're, they're, they're two different entities. But that, um, but that there's no, but come on, now there's no, there's no documentary evidence that connects the Stratford Shakespeare mm -hmm. to writing or education. There and is to no. Me, that's a must. You there have is to. no. There is nothing that has been found. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. 
It just hasn't been found. Maybe, okay, well, here's one for Maybe you. it was destroyed. When the Stratford men died in mm -hmm. 1616, no one said a word. When Ed, uh, Edmund Spencer, a famous poet during the same time period, yeah. died in 1599, there was a huge funeral. Uh, it was paid for by the Earl of Essex, and he was buried in Westminster Abbey. The same with um, Ben Jonson. He was buried in Westminster Abbey. He had many tributes when he died. Okay. How come one of the most famous writers of the period and, and respected, mm -hmm. how, did, how is it that his death passed with no one saying a word? So these are all the, you know, the problems with the authorship of The Stratford Man. What about when Howard Hughes died? A very influential man, a very industrial man, a man who did a lot. You know, nobody really stopped to give a second chance, a second look to him. So, that doesn't prove anything to me. Well, if you look at how contemporaries treated writers, uh, you know, who were respected, mm -hmm. it is unusual. And then there's another interesting thing is, um, as I mentioned, there was a lampooning of Lord Burley, who was one of the most powerful men in England. How come the Strapper Man didn't go to jail? Um, also, uh, the play Richard II was, you know, that's a Shakespeare play. That was performed the night before the Essex Rebellion. They, they used that play to sort of get people into the, in the mood of, of deposing a monarch. Now, why wasn't the, the writer of this play arrested? So, you know, there's many things like that. Well, that but what about the if will? If you add them all up, mm -hmm. it's problematic. What about his will? The will that was uh, signed by William Shakespeare, and that was yep. read when he was on April 23rd, 1616, when he died at the age of 52. What about that? Yes. Yeah, interestingly, there's no books mentioned in the will, and books were very expensive items back then. There's no mention of theater shares. Mm -hmm. um, nothing that would connect. You could read this will with a, a, with other normal people of the period who are not writers, and you're not going to find, you know, there's nothing in there that indicates he was a writer. All right, listen, we've got to take our final break, Exxon Nation. I'll be back on the other side as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 
4213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Exonation Catherine Chilijan is our special guest this hour. ShakespeareSuppressed.com is her website, and she is the author of Shakespeare Suppressed. You know, this almost sounds like the story of Jesus Christ because, you know, there's no documentation to prove that he actually existed. There's nothing that talks about, that is written about in any of the New Testament about his childhood years. So we could actually say the same thing about Jesus that we're saying about about Shakespeare, right? Um, well, um, yeah, like in some ways, but um, we have a lot more records, let's put it that way. You've got a lot um, more believers. During this period, yeah. You've got a lot more believers, too. Um, I, I'm having a problem with the... With the lack of facts. There's a lot of coincidence here. I'll I'll give you that. There's a lot of coincidence. But when it comes to the facts, when it comes to, all right, let's say he didn't exist. So what? The work, whoever did it, is great. No one around the world. Well, let me clarify that I'm not saying that he didn't exist. He, he existed, but there were just two people, two different individuals there, with that name there are, who were involved in the theater. And, okay, I'm going um, to I'll give you an example. Problem. I'll give you an yeah. example. Right now, there are four Rob McConnells that are in the Canadian media. Wow. That's a great example. Okay, yeah. so, and yet, I don't, I, I've talked to one of them on the phone. I don't know the others. We're not related. They live in different parts of Canada. But I am Rob McConnell. Yes. So. It's the same thing. There were two William Shakespeare's involved in the theater at the same time. How, and do, how do you know? That's why it's so confusing. <laughs> so who, who's to blame here? Is it William Shakespeare who's to blame here? Is that William Shakespeare, the one that we know that who, 
who perpetrated some deceiving plot What's 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 the end game yeah. here? What's well, the point? Well, it's a combination. Uh, the, the great author, um, being a man who is highly ranked, um, you you don't want credit during your lifetime. Mm-hmm. So that that was the reason he was silent during his lifetime. But after one's death, if you you know if you had works to publish, it mm-hmm. would be okay to do that if your family, you know, wanted to, chose to. And that was the perfect opportunity. But maybe but the family for some reason they didn't do this. Maybe with the, the family, Earl of Oxford. Maybe the family sold the 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 rights to the plays, and the family, for some reason, yeah. maybe they needed money. I don't hey, know. But, but we can see the same. But there, there's the, also the fault on the Stratford man's family too, and his neighbors. But once why again, why didn't they say that he was the great author? Why didn't? They mention it. Why didn't they make reminiscences? reminiscences Maybe of they him? didn't want to. Maybe that was his, one of the wishes that he wanted. He didn't want this extra hoopla. I don't know, but we can say the same thing about many other characters in history. Many yeah, others. But but you also have to look what contemporary writers were were writing about the great author during this time period. His contemporaries, and they were saying by inference. And this is a whole chapter in my book, that mm-hmm. he was a man who was highly ranked, yeah. that he wrote anonymously, yeah. that he wrote as a hobby, mm-hmm. uh, that by praising him will stain his name, mm-hmm. you know, so, um, that he was dead by 1605 to 1609. We have several references. So right. we do have to look at what can, people in the know, who are, you know, in the writing world, Listen, said about him. Here we are in the year 2017, and people still believe that Elvis is alive. People still believe that John F. Kennedy is alive in a bunker in the White House. So a conspiracy theory, it's a belief based on a hypothesis, not based on fact. Well, my book gives facts, fact after fact. Well, give me some really facts. Give, me, give yeah. me some facts. I haven't heard any facts yet. Here, well, here, here's one. Um, in 1640, um, a, a book of Shakespeare poems and this is, you know, decades after the Stratford man had died. Yeah. Um, and there was an, the image, the well-known image of an engraving of Shakespeare that we would know. And they reproduced that image. And underneath it, mm-hmm. there was this line. And it says, this shadow is renowned Shakespeare's, with a question mark, the soul of the age, with a question mark. Okay. So this is someone in 1640, not too long after the Stratford man had died, questioning the man in the first folio, that image, that is really the author? So this, it's not just the last 200 years. It, there's been questioning since 1640. So where's the proof? Also, well, these are all little bits and pieces that, that come together. Very nicely. Also, in 1640, somebody wrote to Shakespeare in a book, an anonymously written a line, Shakespeare, we must be silent in thy praise. Okay. Why? Why should we be silent? You know, so, and yet, if you look at that line, mm-hmm. you are praising Shakespeare, right? But he, they're saying we must be silent in, in praising you. Well... Maybe Shakespeare was not the real name of the author. So they are being silent in his praise. They're not saying the real author's name. So these are all things that make one doubt. And, you know, a great website is doubtaboutwill.org. And you can see many people, Supreme Court justices and actors and and people uh, with doctorates in every other field, Mm -hmm. Um, saying that there is reason to doubt that the Strafford man was a great author. And yet nobody can prove any evidence to substantiate the claims because there's a reason but it's a hypothesis. But we can't prove the Strafford man was the, the great author either. That's, so, that's so, the irony. Yes. That's not irony. That's tit for tat. Yep, tit for tat. Yep. But once again, looking at the big picture... 2017. How is this information going to change my life? How is this information going to make this a better world? How is this information going to help with climate control? How is this information going to stop the problems with ISIS? How is this information going to stop the diseases that are plaguing this earth? 
Who cares? It's just a matter of the truth. And for people who love Shakespeare, they're going to love him even more when they finally have a biography to connect him. But what happens with. if the truth that what happens if the information that everybody has now on Shakespeare is the truth, and that this conspiracy theory was just invented by people who were envious of Shakespeare? Well, I mean, it's it's the predominating. Um, theory right now, so um, no one's going to get hurt. <laughs> well, it's it's a theory that, according to statistics, isn't shared by very many people in academia. Um, it it is shared by people. It's just I, it's um, shared the people, by people in the English department. They're the ones.